So tonight, our guests are Charles Edwards and Jerry Astorino. Both served as mayor in, in, to Lakeway in consecutive terms. Charles from 1999 to 2003, and Jerry from 2003 to 2005. And each contributed in various roles to the city, including participation in the Zoning and Planning Commission. After I set the stage for tonight's discussion, I'll ask Charles and Jerry to give us their background, and then I have some questions to start with. And you'll have the opportunity to ask questions as we go along. For a background, in 1962, the founders of Lakeway came to the bluff overlooking Lake Travis and decided to acquire the first parcels of land from Houston oil man and rancher Jack Josephson. This land would soon become Lakeway. The Lakeway Inn opened in July 1963. The first homes were built in sections one and two that year. The Lakeway Corporation was the governing entity at that time, but in fact, Lakeway was governed for those years by the Travis County Executive. And our Lakeway, what we know as Lakeway today, was part of the extraterritorial jurisdiction, the EJT, ECJ of Boston. Lakeway grew modestly in the 1960s by today's standards. Residents knew that Boston was able to annex land in its ETJ without <coughs> local consent. So in 1972, the Committee of Concerned Citizens was established to consider local rule for Lakeway. <coughs> The interests of several stakeholders need to be considered. One, the city of Austin. Two, the Lakeway Corporation, which founded Lakeway and by 1972 had been transferred ownership to Dallas developer Robert Alpert, who had great plans of his own. And three, the local residents of Lakeway. The result of negotiated agreements and a local election was the incorporation in 1974 of the village of Lakeway to be governed by a mayor and two aldermen. Since 1974, the city of Lakeway has elected 15 mayors. Each mayor sets the agenda for the city council and acts as a spokesman for the city. The city manager, in turn, administers day-to-day -day city affairs, implements the policies established by the council, and ensures that the daily that the city operates in a fiscally responsible manner. So with that background, I'd like to ask our two mayors to give us their background and perhaps a little about how you came to be residents of Lakeway. Charles, can I go first? You want me to start? Okay. We came to Lakeway because of my late wife discovered it when she was reading a brochure. And the, air, and the airline uh, on the way to Austin to visit her sister, 1989. And she informed me that I think that I have found a place for us to retire. So <laughs> that was the start of the decision making right there. And uh, we actually built a home and moved in in November 1990. But I remember you telling the story about when your wife made that decision for you, you were out hunting. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> My son and, were, and I were in Del Rio hunting. And uh, she called and she said, that's when she said, hey, I think uh, we found a place. And that was in Thanksgiving of 1989. So one year later, we moved in. Yeah. Jerry? You know, which, where are you from and your background and how you got to Lakeway? Um, That's three questions. Yeah, okay. First, first one is I am a New Yorker. I was born in, uh, in the East River. <laughs> I lived in the Bronx until I was 17 years old in a, in a very important spot, the geographical center between. Yankee Stadium and the Bronx Zoo. After that, I went to uh, Maritime Academy in Maine. I got drafted into the Army, and I immediately got rid of that, and I got commissioned in the Navy and 
been back for 25 years. And the uh, best thing I did was sitting in that chair over there and I get the white hair. <laughs> <laughs> and she's been sitting in the chair for 62 years. <laughs> the secret is, if you go to sea for half the time, so how do we get the leg weight? I'm going to try to make this quick because we, after retirement, <coughs> we were in Northern Virginia, not far from, from, from Charles, and we both got downsized within 60 days of each other. So it became necessary to get someplace where it was not quite as expensive as Northern Virginia. So at that time, we had a daughter <coughs> in, in College Station and a son in Denver. So we decided to find a place in between those two so we could uh, terrorize them equally. <laughs> <laughs> and and we, uh, we did some re research and found the breakaway. And then uh, Joni got involved with the real estate lady and looked at 29 houses. <laughs> I still have that number. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Charles? The next question, and you can answer this one first, how did you get involved in Lakeway politics? Well, it, it started uh, when I met the city manager at some meeting, and he, he found out my background, being in the Army and Army Aviation, and of course he was a retired Air Force colonel. He said, uh, <coughs> I think we're going to need you over on the building and planning. And, he called and he said, the mayor wants you to be on zoning and planning. <coughs> so, okay, that started in 1992. I had been to about three meetings and the chairman departed for California. And that moved Jack McLaren up to be the, the chairman. Jack said, all right, I want you to be the vice chairman. I said, whoa, you know, I haven't been here long enough. I don't know much of the, even our ordinances. Yeah. And he said, well, that's all right. Uh, the mayor wants you to do that. Also, at that time, as the vice chairman of the zoning and planning, you were also a voting member of the building commission, or building committee, as we called it. So I had two meetings, uh, two to three meetings a week. So on um, these, these activities, and the the building committee at that time was was running about an eight hour shift. It started eight in the morning. We'd probably be through by four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So the city now contracts a lot of this stuff out. We were doing back in those days. Our mayor and. Uh, 1998, we, we couldn't get him off a top dead center on doing some things. And so I had a wonderful campaign manager <laughs> who was in the audience tonight with a lot of persuasion to, to run. So I finally made the decision to run. Joanne and Jimmy were in uh, Europe. And she didn't get her voicemail until she got back to New York. And she called, she said, you decided to run. He said, yeah, okay. She put it together, along with some, a lot of help. We got it done. So I went in office in May of 1999. Thanks. Jerry, how did you get involved in Lakeway politics? I was golfing with the then mayor, Jack O'Neill, and he said, why don't you give me a uh, a biology of yourself. And I said, why? He said, oh, I'd like to you know what your background is. So give me one of those. I said, no. <laughs> he said, come on, I'm in there. Give me one of those. And then he called me up and said, did you do all this? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, yes, you did. I, I, want, I, want you, I want you to be on the zoning commission. And I said, what is that? And he said, you'll, you'll find out. <laughs> I did. And while I was doing that, uh, it came up to uh, election time. And he said, I, I, I want you to run for council. I said, I'm not a lawyer. And he said, no, no, run, run. And so I, I talked to Tony and I said, I want you to run for council. 
And I think I'll, I think I'll do it because I, I don't stand a chance. Nobody knows me. <laughs> it was a tiny cast that was going to vote for me here. And so here I was, elected. So I was on the council for four years. And then my best friend sitting on my left hand side said, uh, I'm finished, so you, you, you better run for mayor. <laughs> and I said, No. <laughs> I have to learn how to say no. I, I don't get that right. So I, I, I did, and once again, uh, I was the most the most surprised guy in town because I was I was still a New Yorker, Italian American, ex sailor and there I was being married. Thank you. Well, with your both having been on the zoning and planning commission, the next area I think would be of interest to everyone has to do with building facilities for the city of Lakewood. And I know one of the controversies that we all probably remember was the activity center. And didn't that come to fruition during your administration, Charles? Um, the vote had been taken and the, uh, <coughs> building, the building was underway. And uh, right about the time I went into office, our builder went bankrupt. So we had to put together an organization, get the sub paid, keep the city from being sued. And so we, we finally got uh, a contractor to take over the job, but I also got uh, a volunteer engineer who I knew um, to help us out to review the six circumstances and um, between Otis and and, uh, and Dave Benson, our city manager, got it put together and, and got the thing built. We opened it in November of 1999. And uh, one of the aspects of that was you didn't have enough money in, right. the, in the budget to, to complete the project. So how was that funded? Well, there was contributions uh, from the LCC and um, some other sources. Uh, and I think we ended up taking some money out of the general fund that had not been appropriated through, through the bond. So, but that was- You had to come up with a, a 1.6 million was what was budgeted, but you had to come up with another 400,000 to finish the project, didn't you? Uh, I don't remember those exact numbers, but uh, we did. But like I say, I think it came from contributions and we took some from the general fund and Jerry might have to help me out on that. That was no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so after the activity center, one of the next major construction within the city was the new city hall. Another bond issue and another challenge that the two of you shared together. <laughs> Actually, it was came to fruition in in Jerry's uh, successors. Uh, yeah, we got the bond passed uh, in the spring of 2003. So the plans and the actual construction follow through with Jerry and uh, his council and city manager Dave Dave Benson. Um, they did a wonderful job. That. That particular bond built the city hall as we know it now, revamped the old city hall into the Justice Center, and built this public works off of Serene Hill Drive. And so it was a three way project. And we, we sold some land. We had another council in previous years that acquired 30 acres in that area. We sold uh, some of it, 10 acres I believe, which is now Serene Hills. That, that gave us some money uh, to augment that bond. That was, that was a three-way project that turned out very good. So you got it going and left the implementation to Jerry. Yes. <laughs> and how did that go? It went, it went very well. We started off with uh, you know, the, the, 
<clears throat> the heroes were the police because they joined, they knew that there was something in it for them, and which, which was to get everybody out of that building so it could be in just this kind of And to do that, we, we also needed to move the public works out of the residential area. Quite, quite a, an education. Um, so many times, buildings stopped because we, we struck water by digging. And everything was all stopped and there was, there was mud all over the place. Who knew there was mud? You know? uh, but it, it got done. It got done. It, uh, and Dave Benson worked hours and hours and hours a day. And he, uh, he did a wonderful job. He really, he really did. And, and, and we, had, we had some good, uh, uh, good construction folks too. You would learn from the activity centers that you needed to staff it well. Indeed, I was bringing the company in the uh, and the shortfall in the money was was really a stopper that it went on for you know, it, it got to be a, a cruel joke. The activity center got to be a cruel, a cruel joke. People would say, there's the, there's the non-activity center there. <laughs> one, one note here. <laughs> Before the activity center, the only place that we had to, that we could meet was in what was called the property owner's room down at the Live Oak Clubhouse. That that room was about twice as big as this this room right here, so we couldn't you couldn't feel many people in there. So it was a godsend to have it our activity center. For the first criticism we had, you didn't build it big enough. You didn't have a store. You didn't have a, you know, it was just, uh, we, had, we had to build a few things like that. So it's still not big enough and it still not, doesn't have adequate storage and it, you know. But, and it's overbooked every every week, isn't it? Yeah. They have, they have to find, uh, space in other city locations for all of the activities that are demanding time and use of the activity center. So it's been a great success. Let's talk about another building controversy. This one really was a controversy. And Charles, you said that the Walmart controversy started at the men's breakfast. Why don't you cover that? <laughs> That is correct. Sue Potter, who many of you know, remember, Sue was briefing that morning on the status of the activity that was going on in our building and development. And she just happened to mention, oh, well, there's a development group that's considering uh, acquiring land and putting in a Walmart. So that lit a very short fuse. That would happen in the spring of 2003. So Jerry ends up with the brunt of it, with the, all the controversy that went on. And uh, you already take it from there. Yes, you did. <laughs> and now for the rest of the story. <laughs> what you're going to hear now is Democracy 101. I learned that <clears throat> by just developing um, nosebleeds. Turns out that there was a passionate reaction to the word Walmart. And when I looked into it, the person who Sue was talking about was a guy who just came out of nowhere and he had a, an artist's rendering of a small place with uh, small stores and a Walmart. And people heard Walmart and they, they, got, they got inflamed. The passions were, were lit and the, the town became polarized overnight. Neighbors who were friends stopped being friends. Golfing uh, foursomes broke up. And I'm sitting here thinking, do I need a fiddle and stop waiting, waiting for the start of flame to when it's burning? What the hell's going on here? So I called Walmart, identified myself, I told them what who I was, and and uh, I, I said, my town is, is polarizing. It's, it's a, there's a passionate anti-Walmart faction, 
and it's, it's, it's tearing up the town. So I need you to tell me, are you going to go to Walmart in Lakewood? No. That's, that was the answer. Or one of the Walmarts, I forget that lady, whatever her name is, was a Walmart person. <clears throat> so I thought, okay, this is, I'm going to fix this because I just talked to them and they're not coming. So I said that, nobody believed me. A lot of democracy. People were, were saying, that, you know, what they, what they believed in. And other people were saying uh, what they believed in and they were just going in opposite directions. So I called the aunt. I said, you got to tell me the truth. <laughs> and so she said, what do you think I'm telling you? Right? We're not going, we have no plans. We're now with a future for Lakeway. We have other places that are, that are going to give, bring, us, bring us more revenue. Okay, so now we got a reason for doing this. <laughs> revenue. And so they, 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 they marched with stop signs in the street. They marched with signs in, in the council chambers. Yeah. And I'm sitting there thinking, who the hell called this meeting? <laughs> Why are we doing this? They just don't believe me. I've never had anybody not believe me. <laughs> they didn't believe me. So I called again. <laughs> that was number three. And so I, I told everybody, people would stop me at random. It was Randall's. No, no Walmart. No H and B. They stopped me at Randall's and they just read, read me the riot act. You know, what the hell did you come in here for? You're going to do the other. I said, I'm not going to do anything because Walmart's not coming. Yeah. <laughs> so at a, con at a council meeting, it, it got so, so loud with screaming and yelling and, and uh, signs going back and forth. Four policemen were starting to back out the door. So I, I, once again, I promised to call. This time, I didn't get that same nice lady. I got some guy who was, was ready to chew my, my head off. And he said, we are not going. I'll tell you where we're going, and it's not Lakeway. I said, thank you very much. That was five. The council decided that they would buy enough, enough uh, to be able to put in an HEB. And that got to be okay. Now we can get on with building, building three buildings, help this, this building get, get built. And the, the old one had to be taken down, and this had to be put up. Uh, and the, the Heritage Center was doing it by themselves, but the city was kind of watching it and, and giving some help where they could. In the meantime, these three events also had to take place simultaneously. And the money was there with the help of the police. And Dave Benson just worked himself sick. And uh, <clears throat> it got done. You ready for this now? On budget, on time. Three brand new buildings. Very good. Yeah, and that, was, that was that. And that's when I retired again. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great story. Thank you very much. There's more. I'm sure there is. But we're going to, we're going to go on. We're going to go on to something else that uh, I, I know. I, yes. Do this so I can get even with him. This. That's where I'm going. So, the topic is the beer, and it was a big controversy. It still is a controversy, but I don't think it's quite as big as it was, Charles. You took the brunt of that. Well, so, he did. That, that was one of the things that was happening um, with the previous mayor that I ran against. Uh, you know, he acknowledged we got a beer problem, but not wanting to do anything about it. But the beer situation back then, most people in this room don't know. It was very much overpopulated with beer. So once I got in the office, I, I called and got in touch with the head guy at Parks and Wildlife. And I got him to come out here and take a look at our situation three different times. And then the third visit, okay, I need a recommendation of how we can approach this. And he said, okay, you have about 3,000 deer in the city right now. And the city at that time was 5,500 acres. And my recommendation is you need to take out a couple of thousand as soon as you can, maybe the next couple of years. Well, 
we launched into that program. And at that time, we were able to trap and remove and move our deer to ranches. The ranches that had had an anthrax problem, there were, there were counties to the west of us that, that wanted to repopulate after their anthrax death. So that was pretty successful. Yeah. And after the first uh, couple of years, Parks and Wildlife made a bold decision and said, okay, there are no, no more ranches need, need deer. And uh, so what you're going to have to do is travel and, and uh, have them process and give the meat away. Well, we lost into that. And, but the first two years, we took out 1,500 deer. And uh, that, was, that was a big slug. See, people were, that were moving in, building uh, homes and landscaping, their landscape would disappear within a couple of weeks. It's hard for our, our, our current residents to understand that we had a severe problem. We were killing 15, 20 on the street virtually every day. Where the area at the arena was, the first day when I became the mayor, I was prioritizing the things I had to do. Deer was on my list. So I, had, I still had Walmart and I had some building and I had this and I had deer on there. And so I was thinking, who, who is Jerry Astorino that knows deer? And there ain't one. The closest I ever got to a deer was selling hot dogs in the Bronx Zoo. I knew that reindeer didn't fly. That's about all I knew. So I had it. I had somebody. I said, Charles, would you take care of the deer? Because I got, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I said yes. And you know, Charles is me, Charles. He threw me on for another ten years. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Listen, this was his very first day in office. <laughs> I was we'd had the changeover. I was mowing my lawn. Jerry called and he said, uh, I want you to take over the deer committee. I said, well, no. <laughs> get out of the frying pan into the fire, you know? So, uh, well, there's one, there's one part of the deer situation that you didn't cover yet. Yeah. And that is how you got Dave Benson arrested. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't get him arrested. Neither did I. <laughs> well, you had to deal with it. Okay, it takes a little bit of background. Um, I told a story about the trapping and moving to ranches or to um, wherever the Parks and Wildlife. Uh, in the year 2000, I believe it was in March of 2000, we were doing our last trap. The deer trapper had 66 deer on the trailer. They were destined to go to the Sam Houston National Forest. Plan was that the biologist for the Sam Houston National Forest was to meet the trailer were at the um, en route. The trailer had a flat, or maybe more than a flat, so they had to fix it. They notified this biologist that they either, they're going to be late. They notify her when they get into the forest. They notified her at around 3 a.m. that they were there ready to unload the deer. She said, just leave them in the trailer. I'll be down after daylight to supervise the release. Wow, that's bad news. So she arrived at daylight. They opened up the trailer, and 24 of them had been trapped with a death. So she panics and calls the game warden that came out Dane Morton called up Benson because his, his signature was the first authority in the line. He started asking Benson his social security number or you know, a, a, a phone number. He said, what's going on here? And he said, well, we're going to um, write a charge against you. Well, they made arrangements for Dave to be arrested over in Precinct 2. I took him over there that morning with a check from the city of Lakeway to go his bail, $2,000. It so happens that a lady named Barbara Bembry was the judge. 
she happened to be a Lakeway resident. And this game warden that they had sent down from Temple to make the charge, she said, what's this? Wrongful death of 24 deer? That's the charge against the city manager? So she really groused at him quite a bit. I'm sitting back in the back of the courtroom. It was almost a laughable matter. I wish I had a recording of it. Well, I know you both have spoken uh, very highly about Dave Benson and his contributions to the city. And uh, if you want to say something more about that, yeah, so a little, little bit more. They <laughs> engaged an attorney, and he got the, the charges dropped within about 72 hours. He made a personal visit, visit to Cold Spring, Texas, which is the county seat of the county where the charge was made. And um, so that was fine. So then, based on our attorney's recommendation, uh, we had to get a specialized attorney to go clear Benson's record, expunge the record. That still had not occurred at the end of my term, my first term. I was not happy. Uh, so I, that was my decision to run for a second term because we didn't have Benson cleared. This guy had to do, even though we had the order to do it, the very last criminal record was held by the Texas Parks and Wildlife. And I let the commissioner of Texas Parks and Wildlife know that. I figured my mission was complete in regarding that and getting Dave cleared. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to another, another topic. The Lakeway Civic Corporation is a very important part of the city of Lakeway and perhaps not as well known as uh, other aspects of our community. But would each of you speak about the importance of the LCC and how it has improved Lakeway during your administration? Yeah, yeah. We both served uh, at different times uh, on the LCC. <coughs> and um, it was one, once again an education for me. And it, it represents a, 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 a stroke of genius on the part of the founder of Lakeway. Because they, they came up with that, uh, $250 per property and for, you know, for revenue. And then other, other members during the, the course of the years uh, did some very, very astute uh, uh, oh, I was gonna say manipulation, but not manipulation, but it was it, it, uh, good, good investment in various stocks and bonds and stuff. So there's a constant flow of, of money. And as, as an example, uh, there was really no budget for landscaping around the brand spanking new city hall. And so a, a, a landscaper submitted a, uh, a plan. And fortunately for me, as then mayor, I had an expert that could go to for her opinion. <clears throat> and she said, there's too much stuff here. And I said, well, it's, it's, it's you know, going to be a plant? She said, yeah, but they grow. And they're going to get all together, and they're going to kill each other. So take about a third of them out of there. And they saved money too. So I said, thank you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. We cut that down. But the point was that we, we had the money, but we didn't have to put all those plants in. So we took the, the money out that, that was uh, left breathing room for the plants that we just put in. And that money came from the LCC. And, and the LCC steps forward Every single time, something that should be done could be done because of the LCC. The breakdown for the funding, the jury covered uh, of the money on each lot. It doesn't. It didn't cover the entire city. It was only uh, the original sections of those uh, properties that were in those sections. So. 
Um, for example, where I live right now, Tuscanwood is not included in in the, that aspect. So um, it was limited to a degree. I mean, when as the city expanded, and we're, it still has that that nucleus of money that came from those the sale of those lots, those original sections. So. Thank you. Uh, well, this is another element of construction. I don't think it's a controversy, but the, uh, the uh, Emmaus Church has a cross that Father McCabe <laughs> arranged to be erected there. What? Jerry, can you talk about that? It's a resident Catholic. Yeah, I can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's two things about that. One is the church. There was an awful lot of uh, uh, not not supporting the church, and I was I was not I was involved with the, the legal aspect, not with the, the religious aspect. And I, once again, I got lucky because there was a. a, a <clears throat> There was a, a, a controversy somewhere in the vicinity of east of of, uh, of uh, San Antonio, and the, 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 the result of that came down to the big thing in the paper. There was a seven day paper in those days, and uh, what what the judge held was that the, the little city out there was not authorized and was not able to tell the church what it could do and what it couldn't do. And so it was, <clears throat> there was no legal way to stop that church. I said, ah, McCabe wants to build this church. It's, it's, in, the, it's, in, it's half built and these guys want to stop it. Turns out, there is no legal way to stop it. It's a violation of the First Amendment. So, and, and, and as it turned out, most of the most of the growling was coming from some people who lived on the other side of the the, the, <coughs> the uh, driving range for the, the, golf, the golf golf club, and they're up high, looking down at this Catholic church. Well, we got a church of our own. Okay, you got a church of your own, but there's going to be another church, and you can't stop it because it's illegal to stop. So now, <coughs> then we come to Monsignor McCabe, who never missed an opportunity to make money or get money from somebody. <laughs> That's how a Catholic priest gets to be Monsignor. Get money. <laughs> Don't tell anybody that. <laughs> so he, 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 Came into either, either somebody told them or they had an idea themselves that you can put a, a, a structure that uh, a, a, re, a relay antenna can be put inside. So we call them stealth antennas. So up goes the cross and in goes the antenna, and here comes money to, to the church. And so a, a, a lady who didn't like the side of that um, raised a fuss. And the immortal words of McCabe were, it's up and it's legal. And that was the end of that. Okay, there's one powerful. Go ahead, Jerry. The words of, of Monsignor McCabe were, it's up and it's legal. Everybody get that? Yeah. <laughs> the, the other thing he said was, it's a lot easier to do something other than asking for permission. Yeah. Oh, asking for permission. Your words to that one now. Okay, can I put this down now? <laughs> <laughs> but he said that um, I was over zoning and planning when uh, the the planning was underway for the Emmaus Church. Well, Monsignor McCabe recruited a gentleman named Block Ulbrich mm -hmm. to put up a sign along Lomans that future home of the Emmaus Church. 
Well, of course, we had a sign ordinance that, uh, you know, it had to be approved by the city. So one of our members came and announced uh, at a meeting, he said, we have a sign along the Lomans. And uh, it appears that we have never approved that. So Jack McLaren was the chairman. He said, okay, so find out what the story is on this sign. Well, she reported to the next meeting and then Monsignor was in the audience. And Jack said, I want to know the story on this illegal sign out here. Monsignor said, well, he gets up and he said, uh, I found out a long time ago it was better to ask permission than to I didn't ask, 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 ask forgiveness than to ask permission. So, <laughs> the other story that we, we might consider is that Monsignor McCain was so successful with his cell phone tower that the fire department thought that they'd get in on the on that on that deal, and the flagpole was raised next to the fire department. That's right. What happened there? Nothing good. <laughs> uh, you, you want to expand on that? Well, it, it, it was, uh, uh, <clears throat> the contrary folks who thought that the flapping of the flag in Britain was too loud. And uh, it just got worse and worse. And so the flag came down and the, the pole came down there. Yeah, they modified, modified the flag and the size and the fringe and, yeah. and tried everything to reduce the noise. Yeah. Well, we couldn't stop, we couldn't stop the wind. <laughs> well, I have two more topics before we open it up for questions. The, next, the first topic is, has to do with the Historical Society and the Heritage Commission and how this building got approved and there was uh, a city council meeting that I think you were called to. Yeah, well, uh, set that one up. <clears throat> this property that we're on right now was acquired through a trade. <clears throat> Councils before our time had the foresight to purchase the land where the activity center is, or all, where the current city hall is, all that wraps around them. Well, it happens to be that that property that's uh, uh, along Lakeway Drive, everything except where the old market, uh, city market was, and, and where Rocky's building is there, was owned by the city. So it was traded two acres up there, approximately two acres, for these two acres here. And um, the comprehensive plan, the initial comprehensive plan that was ever developed for the city happened in the year of 1998 and was presented to incorporate the Lakeway Historical Society into the city, come into the city umbrella. So that was easy just to take the members of the board of the historical society and make them the original heritage commission appointed. So um, there was money that had been donated over the years. It was, I think it was $120,000 Bob Laws and uh, our volunteer architect came up with plans, and it was going to cost about $160,000 to do this building. And one of the controversial points or the expense was they really wanted to put a metal roof on it. And um, it was going to cost another $10,000. Well, with all that discussion going on, the very first uh, night there, Hayden Dollett said, if a metal roof is that important, 
I'm going to build a nation for $10,000. So when he did, that's the reason why we have a metal roof on this building. Now, in the discussion that it was going to require a, about $40,000 out of the general fund to augment the 120 to proceed with the building, to get a positive vote at night. Gary, um, well, let me back up a little bit. Peggy Point was the chairman of the building, uh, excuse me, she was the chairman of the Heritage Commission. She called out of her home because I didn't want to get into Jerry's business. Uh, she persuaded me to come to council that night because people were afraid they were going to lose the vote on getting this building approved. Well, I'm sitting behind these ladies, most of these ladies were on it at that time. And with all the back and forth controversy on the council, they started, they literally started crying. And they just, I mean, they were so visibly upset that I, Jerry had already closed the public discussion. I raised my hand and I went to the podium and I, I really kind of tied in with the two council members that were causing all the problems. And then he got it to a vote and the vote passed. It passed, what, four to two or something like that. And so that's how it went down when this building was built. It turned out very well. And we thank you for that. Both of you. Well, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to uh, have taken that. Uh, I, I was sitting there as the mayor with a hammer in my hand. And how can I? How can I use this against the Americans? Well. It worked, it worked out. One of, one of those two council members wouldn't speak to me for a year. <laughs> two, two years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, the second topic that I was referring to is one that uh, probably, it's a, this is an individual, Roy Duran, who is probably not that well remembered in, not, not that anything bad, but it, most people are not aware of his name, but he was a World War II veteran who is the reason that we had in our 4th of July parade the, the parade of flags, not Durian, Durant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know Charles knows uh, a lot about the story, and I think that it's a story that we really should know and next 4th of July think about. And if, if you would share that with us, Charles, I appreciate it. Well, uh, my late wife was the parade chairman for a goodly number of years. I think it was around 10 years, but somewhere in that um, period of time, she learned that Roy Duran, who was a former resident of Lakeway, um, had really gotten this, what we know as the Lakeway uh, Parade, Fourth of July Parade and the activities. Roy was a, um, it, it was the night in 1976 was the year it was triggered. Um, Roy was a POW of the Japanese. He was captured <coughs> on the 27th of November, 1941. Think about that day. How many days before Pearl Harbor? Roy was in the Philippines. He was an infantry advisor to the Filipino scouts. And Roy survived the Bataan Death March. He, <coughs> he survived two ship sinkings 
if, they, if the Japanese were taking POWs to the main island and other places to, to work. Anyway, um, he was repatriated by the Russians. He was in Manchuria. And the um, reason why I know a lot about Roy is that my late wife wanted him to be the parade marshal. At that time, the grand marshal had already been selected, so we, she put him in as a parade marshal. And I was his driver. He stayed with one of his friends here, uh, and I drove him in the parade. So he reacted to my questions, and that's the reason why I know a lot of the details about Roy. And I believe it was the next year we brought him up to be the Grand Marshal. Well, we didn't ask him to speak. He, uh, you know, by this time he's well enough in age, and he wasn't a, um, a he wasn't uh, disabled necessarily, but he, excuse me, he left. He and his wife left Lakeway in about the mid-80s to move to the Army Retirement Community in San Antonio. And she had passed away and um, he was still in pretty good shape. And so you know, we, were, we were very happy to, to get him back here and be recognized as, uh, you know, um, a lot of modifications have have gone on as far as the, the parade and how it goes down, but that was the trigger point. I, look, I think we've got to come to a conclusion, but I want to say thank you to all of you for joining us, and thank you especially to our mayors, Charles and Jerry, for being here and sharing their remembrances. This was a great evening. Thank you so much. I guess...